Would you turn to the book of James chapter 1 with me, please, this morning? James chapter number 1. And uh, we'll start reading here from the epistle of James, addressed to the twelve tribes scattered abroad. James chapter number 1. And verse number 12, the infallible text says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. Let no man say, When he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed, then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. James reminds us in verse number 13 that God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. So when the blasphemer wrote his book and said that Jesus Christ was tempted with homosexuality, it reveals a deep, dark hatred in his heart for the Word of God. And the simple fact is that he will stand one day and give an account to Almighty God. And God will look him right square in the eye and say, where in the universe did you ever get the idea that my son was tempted to be a sodomite? In the book of James, chapter number 1, in verse number 13, he said, God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But I can. I certainly can be tempted with evil. And in verse number 14, because I'm a man, I don't set myself aside as anything else but a man. And every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. So let's make a very simple analysis of the statement. And that is that the source of your problem lies within. The scripture says that you are drawn away of your own lust and enticed. Verse number 15. Now we find the progression of sin and the inevitable result of it, and this is without question inevitable. It happens every time. You can count on it. It says in verse number 15, Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Now death, not in the sense that you understand the cessation of physical life, but death not only in the sense of physical life, but in the sense of spiritual life. When Adam and Eve sinned, they stopped spiritually. And not until Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary and thereby ish ushered in the New Covenant and New Testament was any soul able to experience a new birth. And that new birth is what gives us spiritual life again. Until that point, all lived in Adam and all died in Adam from Adam's sin that was handed down to each and every one of us. But James makes some very profound statements, the kind of things that get a hold of you. It's the kind of thing that should make us think. For in verse number 15, he said, Lust, when it is conceived, bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Death of the second death, eventually, in the lake of fire and brimstone, which I believe and the Bible professes. And if you believe the Bible, you believe the day is coming. Not that you take gloat in it, not that you take any glory in it, but the day is coming when every soul that dies in their sin will experience the death of sin, verse 15, which is the second death, which is the lake of fire and brimstone, which is burning forever away from God in an eternal hell. And that's a horrible thought, and I hope and pray that not a one of you leave here today and ever have to die and face the second death and burn forever. I hope that doesn't happen to you. With all of my heart and soul, I hope you're spared from an eternal torment, but if you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, there's no way you can be, and the only hope you have is in man, and there is no hope in man. You can have your head cut off and put in some kind of a cyber chamber, and, and, and cryonics rather, and, and frozen, and one day maybe stick that head back on some other body and come back as something you hope, or you'll have a cure for your cancer, or a cure for a heart disease, or a cure for this or that. But folks, man is not going to cure his problem. His problem is sin. It's not your physical ailment, it's sin. The 
problem with all mankind is he's under a curse. And folks, we can, do, we can stand this morning and explain it away. We can stand today and psychobabble it. We can stand today and deny that it even exists. Or we can stand today and deal with it on scriptural grounds. Only one of those three can give you a possible answer and help, and that is, what does the Bible say about sin? What can we do with it? Is sin a reality? You better believe it. Every waking moment of our lives, every day that we live, everywhere we go, we are faced constantly with sin. We are constantly being bombarded with sin. And sin in the Old Testament is the transgression of the law of God, missing the mark of God, the attitude of the heart, coming short of God's righteousness. The Old Testament Hebrew had a far greater sense of sin than the Greek ever did. The Greek never understood the real issue involved, but the Hebrew writer did. He knew that sin was an affront to God, that it was breaking the commandments of the Lord, that it was coming short of God's righteousness, and a man must give an account for his sin. So all of these Old Testament offerings that they brought to the tabernacle were brought in relation to sin a meat offering, a meal offering, a peace offering. These offerings were brought because he had a burden, he had a guilt, he had, a, he had something in his soul that drove him to come to God and offer something for his sin. He knew that there was a cancer eating away at his spiritual life and that he had to bring a sacrifice unto God. The Old Testament Hebrew understood that. Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and Aximander and the rest of them when they had their great Greek tragedies and stood on their stages and gave out all of their oratories and their speeches, never got a hold of the doctrine of inbred sin. Sin was born in you. Sin lives in you. And sin dies in you. And sin will put you in hell. That is the Bible doctrine of sin. And there is no hope without it. Sin is just like cancer. Sin is just like diseases that leave scars in your body. For inevitably, sin will leave its mark on you. There's not a one in this building today that in one, in one fashion or another, if you've lived any time of this life, you bear the marks of sin. And it either comes out in your speech, they sit on your face, it's in your character and your demeanor, it has something to do with your everyday life, but sin is there. Make no mistake about it, we've got to deal with that issue. Sin is the issue. Sin is the issue. Philosophy is not the issue. Culture is not the issue. Education is not the issue. Your church is not the issue. Your religion is not the issue. Sin is the issue. For Christ died on the cross for sinners. The apostle said, of whom I am chief. That's the issue. Once we get that perspective correct, once we begin to see these things in the light of Scripture, then we can deal accurately with our problem. My problem is not whether I'm a good Baptist. My problem is sin. S-I-N. The most hated, maligned word in the English language. And my friend, that one little three-letter word, sin, is such a powerful thing that it fills the hospitals, it fills the graves with early graves, it breaks up homes, it causes death and destruction on the face of this earth, and it is all because of sin. So what does the Bible have to do with it? Well, there are those today who have a false impression that because of the grace of God, I can go ahead and do whatever I want to do, and God will forgive me for it anyway. That is the idea that let us sin that grace may abound. This is the philosophy of most young people. I will sleep around. I will have my good time and then one day I'll settle down. I'll raise my family and everything will be okay. But God understands that I've got to sow my wild oats. Problem is, you may go ahead and sow your wild oats, but harvest is not going to be in six months. Harvest won't even be next year. Harvest is going to come in when you don't want it to, when you despise the thought of it, when you least expect it, Harvest day will come, for sin will pay wages. So young people today who sleep around and think that they'll go ahead and sow their wild oats and everything will be okay, you know, God's going to forgive me and then I'll have a good home and I'll get married and find a good woman, a good man. And everything will be okay and God's going to forgive me. Forget this simple fact. They are scarring themselves for life. 
Their conscience is scarred. Yes, their mind is scarred. Their body is scarred. Their whole attitude is scarred. Sin leaves scars that will go with you for the rest of your life. That's one of the inevitable things about sin. That's the simple fact that you will never, ever, ever get rid of the scars of sin. You say, well, preacher, I thought when I got saved that God forgave me and he put all of that in the past. Yes, he forgave you. But I'm going to tell you what he restored you to. I'm going to tell you something else. He lets you sit down at a king's table and eat. I'm going to tell you something else. He cast your sins as far, hallelujah, as the east is from the west. I'm going to tell you something else. He made a son of God out of you. You better believe it was a big deal when God saved you. But you're going to say unto me this morning, if you're honest, I still remember. I still remember, and I do too. And it seems the older I get and the more I preach on this, I remember vividly things that happened 30 years ago. I can't even remember what I ate yesterday. It is my memory, and I'm sure the devil helps me with it. Of the things that I did before I got saved, they scarred me for life. There are some things about sin we need to understand. That is, it cost us. It's cost. There's a price to pay. The Bible teaches that when you sin against God, that other people are going to be hurt because of your sin. You just can't get away from that simple fact. If you're a drunkard, your family is going to pay. If you're a thief and you go to prison, your family's going to pay. But pay we will. Crime is a product of sin. It is the legal definition of sin. We call it crime. And our prisons are full of men today and women that we try to rehabilitate. We put them through all kinds of problems, and I'm sure they're well-meaning, but the only thing that will help a criminal is salvation through Jesus Christ, his blood washing his sin away. That's what Bill Pierce does in California. He goes to the prison systems day in and day out and preaches the word of God and he watches hardened criminals, murderers, walk the aisle and fall on their face and accept Jesus Christ as Lord. And God saves their soul. And they are my friend from that day. You can open the prison door and turn them loose because that man or that woman is no longer a scourge upon society. An effect of sin is that the longer you go in it, the harder it is to quit it. The longer you practice it, the harder it is to stop it. If you live and get yourself into this cycle of Christian, this, 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 this little modern Christian cycle of just walk down, confess it, or just confess it to God and everything's okay, go out and do it again, confess it, do it again, confess it and do it again, you're going to find somewhere down the line you don't even bother to confess it anymore. You just do it. Once you fall into the clutches of sin, sin will bind you and it won't let you go. You'll find that it gets easier and easier to sin against God. These are just generalizations, I know. I know I'm not dealing with anything specific, but I'm dealing with a basic issue. Some of you are watching stuff today that five years ago would have shocked you that you would do it. Somebody said, our church is going to watch the Super Bowl tonight. Yeah, Friends comes on after the Super Bowl. And you know something? There's some of you in here this morning that if we put a television screen up here and had a video cassette recorder and we recorded everything you watched this past week and played it back for this church, you'd never show your face at Temple Baptist Church again because you're so accustomed to it. You don't think it's anything anymore. And it's eating like a cancer at your spiritual life. It is digging deeper and deeper and deeper to your very soul. It is marking you. And you'll never, ever, 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 ever break that cycle until you find a place of repentance. And that place of repentance sometimes will never come your way again in this life. And you'll die a Christian unforgiven. 
And I believe if you die a Christian and forgiven, you're still going to go to heaven if you're really born again because you're going to die early. I know the people, I know people that say, well, preacher, now I know a little girl, a little boy got saved when they were 10 or 12 years old. They've been out of church for 30 years and God's working with them and he's going to get them back in one of these days and they've slept with everything in town and they've done everything under the sun but they still believe they're saved. No, they're not. I want, to, I want to tell you something right now. I want to wake you up. I want you to get a hold of this real fast. There is no such thing as a child at 12 getting saved and living 30 years for the devil. No, no. And if you think you can go out and live for the next 30 years for the devil and go to heaven, you're bad wrong. Sadly mistaken. It's when the Christian crosses the point of no return the chastening hand of God can no longer get a real confession out of him. He can no longer really cry over his sin. He no longer feels real despair about what he's doing. He no longer feels that real guilt that's so healthy for us. Guilt is good for you. He can't feel guilt anymore. Therefore, he doesn't repent anymore. It's impossible to repent without feeling guilt. You can't do that. This psycho-babbling age tells you that guilt is bad and therefore repentance is bad because the two go hand in hand. But I'm going to tell you this morning, except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. And the only way you can repent is to feel guilt, condemnation, judgment. You know it's wrong and you confess it and you say, oh God, I'll not do it again and mean it and forsake it. And God will forgive you for it. And then finally, sin is mockery of God. And be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. Yes, he will. The day will come when your ship will come in to the dock. And they'll start taking the cargo out of the hold. And brethren, our memory is so bad, we forget all those things that God doesn't forget. God is not mocked. For whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. Oh, if I had any sense today, I would live for God to get my family a decent place to live. I would live for God to stop the scarring and death of my body and destruction of my spiritual life. I would live for God for what the future may hold for me if I get in a backslidden condition and what it can produce. These are all things to give us a reason to live for God in the midst of an adulterous and abominable generation. We should not let that drag us down. Someone's got to set the standard for this ungodly generation. Don't let their standards become yours. They're nothing but fornicators and prostitutes and reprobates and drunkards and liars. And it's a shame that we even have to send a thing through this church telling people to sign a petition against friends. And it's good that you do it. There's nothing wrong with it. But it only shows the condition of the churches today. That's not even to mention those churches who closed their doors for Super Bowl Sunday tonight. I have to mention that. I can't get out of it. I have to. I have to. Those old preachers 100 years ago roll over in their grave. They would. And the mothers and the fathers and grandmothers and grandfathers of these people that go to these little Mickey Mouse playhouses that call themselves a church, that put a big screen up inside that, inside that building and they play Super Bowl Sunday and, and during the time of the church. Somebody said, well, now, preacher, it's not that bad in our church. We're going to watch the first half, and when the first half is over with, we've got some guy that's going to get up and speak to us for a while. And then when he's finished, we'll watch the second half. Well, what if he doesn't finish before the second half starts? Well, huh? jerk the plug. We're going to watch second half. I mean, hey man, he only sacrificed so much, you know. What are you asking for? I know. I understand. I completely understand. I really do. That's why I laugh about it. It's a joke. You're a joke. The church is a joke. It's all a joke. So just have a big laugh. If you want to talk about serious Christianity, get your Bible open and never close the doors of the church. For a spiritual, for a, for a, for a sports event, it's dead, it's lost, and they've lost the connection to God. Don't you turn the book of John eight now, verse one. 
John chapter 8 and verse 1. Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought him unto, brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. When they'd sat her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses and the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him that they might have to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground as though he'd heard them not. So when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said to them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground, and they which heard it being convicted by their own conscience went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said to her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. Oh, listen. People come to the Lord for all kinds of reasons. In John chapter number 3, Nicodemus came to him at night and said, We know art, thou art a teacher come from God. No man can do the things you do except God be with him. And the Lord Jesus Christ said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. The rich young ruler came to the Lord Jesus Christ and said, Oh, real master, teacher, what great thing can I do to inherit eternal life? I've kept all of the law and the prophets. One thing thou lackest, the Lord Jesus said to him, go sell all you have and give to the poor, and thou shalt have riches. He went away sorrowful, for he had great riches. Master, who then can be saved? The disciple said, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You don't go to hell because you're rich. You go to hell because you'd rather have your riches than God. That's the key. That's the key. Away they went. All kinds of reasons. A man was brought to the top of a house, and the Bible says they opened the top of the house, took the thatched roof away, and they lowered the man down to bring him to Jesus. And when this man came in the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God healed him of his sickness. He took up his bed, and he walked away. He came before God. But these people brought this adulterous woman, ripped her out of the bedroom, took her right away from the very act. What she have on, preacher? The Bible doesn't say, does it? It may have been the most shameful sight they could have imagined. They might have tried to embarrass Jesus Christ as much as they possibly could. They drug her before him, taken in adultery. What now, great teacher, are you going to do with this woman? Well, first of all, let me say this. Whether they realized it or not, they brought her to the best place they could have. There's no other place in the world better than where they brought her. Why, their purpose absolutely was wrong, but they got to the right place. That's the place for the sinner to be brought. Bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the best place you could bring a sinner. He's the friend of sinners. Lo and behold, to their disdain, to their chagrin, it didn't work out the way they expected it to. It never does. This is a classic example of religion intervening between God and the sinner. Yes, it is. You see, it's not a hard matter for a sinner to look at the uplifted Savior and to be saved by the grace of God if he gets a good, clear presentation of the gospel. For he said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. The problem is religion gets in the middle and gets in the way of the sinner's approach to God. That's the problem. You've got to come through our church first. We'll prepare you to take you to the Lord. First, you've got to go through this seminar, learn all the psychobabble. We're going to give you our books, and then you'll understand your positive relationship with the Master. Or you have got to light so many candles, take this catechism, learn this stuff, know all this, and then... You can be brought into the church. But the, the fact of the matter is, it's a simple thing to come to God through Jesus Christ. There is no church. There is no preacher. There is no catechism. There is nothing in the Word of God 
that forbids you to come straight to God through Jesus Christ. That's what I hope to present to you today. That if I get in the way, kick me out of the way. The Lord Jesus Christ is the one you need. You can do without Preacher Lawson, but you can't do without him. And here they did. They brought her to him. Drag her up there. Threw her down on the ground. Boy, I'll tell you, if you ever saw anything in your life, those Pharisees looked down their nose, man. Stood over there like that. I'll tell you, the robes of righteousness really flowed that day. It must have been a sight. It must have. For you've got three parties now. You've got the Savior. You've got the sinner. And you've got the self-righteous. Oh, my. What a sight it would be. This woman was taken in adultery. What are you going to do? Moses said, stone her. Now, what are you going to do? As if to say, now you've been going all over the country teaching all this stuff and preaching to people. And uh, here's Moses, the greatest teacher there ever was. He's the lawgiver. Now, are you going to say something to contradict Moses? He didn't. He simply quoted Moses. He didn't contradict Moses. Moses said such should be stoned, didn't he? He did. He didn't contradict him. He simply reached over there and wrote in the dirt. What did he write? I don't know. Take your choice. I've heard some good speculation. Some of it may be right. But he wrote something in the ground. And beginning at the oldest to the least, they left. Here's what he said to them. You that have not sinned, do according to the law of Moses. You drug her here, you appeal to the law of Moses, I appeal to the law of Moses. Whoever's amidst of you that have not sinned, you be the first one to pick up that stone. And that's the accuser. The accuser was the first one to cast the stone under the law of Moses. If you accuse someone, you took the stone, you threw it first. All right, he said, let's go ahead and let's deal with it under condemnation. Go ahead, pick it up and stone her to death. He knew and they knew and he knew that they knew that he knew their heart and everything they'd ever done. He knew where they slept the night before. He knew what they had to eat that morning. He knew where they were born. He knew the circumstances of their birth. He knew everything there was to know about those sinners standing there. And he said, go ahead, boys. Kill her. Go ahead. Stone her to death. Religion was totally inadequate. Condemnation couldn't do the job. There she lay, a spectacle. Nothing could be done. But the Savior, watching them get up and leave, walked away. There that poor, wretched woman was, trembling. Most probably either naked or not much on. They didn't give her time to dress. They drug her right out of the adultery chamber, right to before him. It wasn't any hard job. It wasn't a problem, mind you. They knew exactly where the red light district was. They knew exactly who was in business and who wasn't. They knew exactly where to go and when to go. And they probably planted their own man. They went in there and they walked right into the room and there they were. No problem, no big deal. There they were. And they picked her up and carried her out and brought her and threw her down and brought her to judgment. That's all man can do for you. That's all the world can do for you. Is judge you. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. This poor old wretched low down Charles Lawson laying there, taken in the very act, was drug up before him, laid prostrate. This old low down Bob Lawson. Wrong oh, as it could be. I don't know of another case in all the Bible where the sinner confrontation between God and the sinner is any more raw than that. I don't know anywhere in the Bible where the where the where the guilt is as clear as it is here. It's as plain as it can be. I can identify with that woman. No, I wasn't taken in adultery, but I was taken in sin. And I was drug right and forth. And we clean. Thank God for it. That was the best day of my life. 
nothing bad could ever happen to me. And for God to expose me head to toe. Oh, look, just bring it all out. And thanks be unto God, religion tried to do her wrong, but she was brought to the Savior of grace. He opened her up. That day exposed her for all that she was. He never condemned, rather condoned what she did. What did he say to her? Go and sin no more. Now there are those little Mickey Mouse grace abusers standing in the pulpit today telling people that Jesus Christ condoned what the woman did because he didn't condemn her. That's a man that knows nothing of the Word of God and our Savior. Jesus Christ never condoned sin. Never. Because it doesn't say in here specifically that I forgive you. They think that it's just a matter of him agreeing with what she didn't know. Go on sin. No more. And the glory of God, this woman got up off the ground, filthy and vile and unclean and despicable, as low as the law gets. But as she came up off of that ground, he said to her, Go and sin no more. She was cleansed on the spot, forgiven of her sin. Her burden was lifted. She was a changed woman from that day on. She went out and began to glorify God. That's what happens to the sinner. That's what makes us different. When I came up off of that dirt in 1973, I'd been forgiven. I'd been cleansed. I wasn't the same anymore. Memories are still here. I remember the hell holes. I remember the things I used to say. I remember what I did. But he doesn't. He's forgotten all about it. So I don't bother to remind him anymore. Just as far as from the east and the west, I'm forgiven. I'm forgiven. Religion can't forgive you. The law can't forgive you. But Jesus Christ's blood can forgive you. And I'm going to speak to you very plainly. If you no longer feel dirty, because you're sleeping in bed with somebody you're not married to, you can't be forgiven. If you don't feel dirty this morning because you've assassinated somebody's character with your mouth, you can't be forgiven. If you don't feel dirty and guilty this morning because you've stolen from someone that you're stealing from your employer, you can't be forgiven. If you don't feel dirty this morning because you're listening to four-letter words all week long, Checking out X-rated movies. Maybe you just you don't have to check them anymore. Just get you a satellite and plug in up there. Get it straight from the source. If you feed on a constant diet of that stuff and you're not guilty, you can't be forgiven. Pharisees walked away unclean and dirty and lost. The whore walked away clean, saved, and forgiven. Truly, prostitutes will enter into the kingdom of heaven before the pastors and the deacons and the trustees and the Sunday school teachers and all of their self-righteous robes, they'll go to hell. Religion is the biggest obstacle to Christ today, just like it was 2,000 years ago. Sinner, I plead with you. I beg you. I beg you. Are you feeling bad, dirty, guilty, bothered by your lifestyle? Does it bother you and upset you this morning? The way you're headed? plead with you. Come to him just like she did. Open and vile. And lay it all out there. And he'll forgive you and cleanse you. He'll save you if you're lost. And restore you if you're backslidden. But in any event, you'll get up clean and forgiven. Fresh and new. How do you know, preacher? How do you know if you really mean it when you ask God to forgive you? Because the next time the temptation comes your way, you'll have strength to say no to it. You'll have power over it. You'll get victory in this life. That's how you know you really were forgiven and you meant it. The next time that same old weak temptation that you're so given to comes down the pot, you'll be able to say by the grace of God, I am that no more. And get up and go on. Forsake it. That's the key. I beg you this morning, can you do that? Would you be willing to come this morning, get on your knees and say, Lord God, Lord God, forgive me. Let me give you one thing and I'll shut up. 
If you sin against the church, confess it to the church. If you sin against an individual, confess it to the individual. If you sin against God, confess it to God. If you've wronged some individual, don't stand up in front of this church and drag a bunch of innocent people into it and cause a big stink that's not necessary. Go to that person. If you've gotten out here and run this church down to this community and blackjarded Temple Baptist Church and talked about it like a dog, then get up in front of Temple Baptist Church and confess that you've done that. If you've sinned against God and you know it's you and God, you and God, you and God, nobody else knows about it, you confess it to God. Are you following me? The devil can use everything under the sun. He can use it. If you want to come this morning and get on your face and say, Oh God, I've sinned against you, then confess it to him. Nobody needs to know. But if you've hurt someone, go to that individual. Confess it to them. Get that straight done. Are you following me? But if you've done the church wrong, stand before the church. If you've made a public shame of your testimony, and you know you have, stand before the church and confess it. Everybody knows already. Stand up and confess it. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray you'd use this for the glory of God. Help these dear people. And we praise you, we exalt you, and we magnify you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for his sake we pray.